Part two, application. So let's take a little bit of what we've covered with rhetoric, especially um, Aristotle's sort of model for it, and apply it to something that is um, very applicable, if not near and dear to the UW community. I'm talking about the Canada Goose. It's not a secret that the University of Waterloo has one of the largest Canada geese populations, resident Canada geese populations, I should say, in all of North America on its campus. And it's also no secret that many students in, and faculty at the university deride the geese because of their droppings, but also because they can become aggressive under certain circumstances. However, I'm about to show you how the language of communicating about the geese makes a difference in terms of how we generally perceive and conceive of these creatures. I want to start by concentrating on an article published a few years ago on the Audubon Society's website. And the reason that this is important is because the Audubon Society is a bird lover's society. And one of their main functions is to educate and also to protect and preserve all birds and not sort of single out and discriminate against any one species. However, I did find that this article has some contradictory elements to it. But before we get to that, let's just start off with an analysis of the headline, because in writing headlines, even if it's a very established and um, credible organization, there is always a lot of rhetoric going on in order to A, capture people's attention, and B, keep people's attention. So in this headline, we'll see a lot of different strategies in play. First, you'll notice that there's a how-to, and the way that we phrase that right away speaks to logos, because it's a practical, or at least it implies that the content in the article is going to be practical. You have a problem, this is how to either resolve it or get around it. So how to get rid of Canada geese. Now the thing about this that's noteworthy is that it's a bit odd that the Audubon Society would use the phrase get rid of for any particular bird species if their mission is to preserve birds and, their, and to promote their appreciation. So that struck me personally as a bit odd in terms of the rhetoric, but it's balanced out in some ways by other parts of this in the subtitle. These birds can be a nuisance. This plays into pathos into our emotions in two ways. The first is that the birds can be. So the language here doesn't state that they are across the board. It just means that there is the potential for them to be, which might make us think, oh, well, maybe they're not all bad. But then the other thing is that we pair the word nuisance with these birds, and then all of a sudden we get the idea that they are somehow opposed to us, offending us, and the word nuisance in itself has, is very interesting because it often means something that is a broad public concern. The third and final strategy at play here appeals to our ethos and comes in short order right after pathos. But there's a humane way to keep them at bay. So even though we can call birds a nuisance, we can give ourselves an out as a society by saying, oh right, but there's a humane way to deal with this, which makes us feel better, makes us feel more responsible, fairer to the wildlife. Although it is interesting that we still have this phrase, keep them at bay, which implies, and this is exactly what rhetoric does, it gives an underlying layer of meaning that suggests that the geese are some sort of imposing, impending force coming for us, quote unquote, and that we need to keep them at bay. Now, what's also interesting about this article is that it's really about a singular researcher named Philip Whitford who has developed this non-invasive, non-violent way of dispensing of the birds. But <clears throat> if we look and go further down into the article, here's an excerpt, we can see that the author is still using some choice language and descriptors that ap appeal to pathos and paint the birds in a negative light. So I'll highlight a section here. To many, the ubiquitous geese have officially become a nuisance, ransacking 
farms and chomping up park and golf course grass. Using these really aggressive words that almost make them akin to sort of Vikings or uh, barbaric invasions where things are being destroyed left and right as they move through whatever environment, definitely gives the reader the impression that the geese are aggressive, that they're violent, that they're destructive. All of these words are associated and connotated when we use things like ransacking and chomping up, typically associated with carnivores, which the geese are not. So there's a bit of mixed messaging going on here, and a bit of too, mi too much, perhaps, of an appeal to pathos. And this is only balanced out at the very end of the article, where Whitford is quoted as saying, you give them a paradise and then you wonder why they're there. This is really interesting as well because the author has essentially chosen not to give any of her own perspective on, let's say, ways to mitigate the birds by, or at least acknowledging that the environment is ideal for them and in, in places like golf courses and parks, and that, as it's stated here, their primary food is short, tender grass that is high in protein, like that grown on golf courses, parks, and lawns. So there's a, a human factor that is causing the birds to gather in the first place, but the author doesn't present any perspective from that angle, at least of her own voice. Instead, she uses a quote from the researcher, and even more interesting, the quote involves the use of you, which signals out to the reader and implies them personally, or I should say implicates them personally in this issue. You give them a paradise, and then you wonder why they're there. So this is a, a good tactic to get people fired up in a way, but it's a bit of a risky tactic because the quote, even though it comes from somebody else than the author, implies that whoever the reader is is then responsible in some way for this situation. So all of these things combined, I think, have good intents, but they, the article itself seems a bit um, contra self-contradicting and maybe not organized as well as it could have been. So when we think about the offices of rhetoric, that arrangement stage and the style stage probably need to be thought through more carefully. I also want to point out at this juncture as well that when it comes to the University of Waterloo campus, we definitely make a paradise for the geese and then wonder why there's a problem. So I'm sorry to any of you who might have been, you know, at one point had a bad run-in with a goose while you're on campus, but really we could be doing more as a university to landscape the campus in a way that's not full of just trim neat, empty lawns, which is the ideal environment to attract Canada geese. If we had more naturalized landscaping that involves wildflowers and shrubs and trees and bushes and not flat open plains of grass, which is essentially there just because of aesthetics, because humans tend to like big, open, nicely trimmed lawns, the geese wouldn't find it that hospitable in the first place, and we probably wouldn't have as many conflicts. I'm going to point to the CBC now here, an article from um, that same year in 2015 about a Canada goose at the University of Waterloo, where even the CBC, which is generally seen as objective, fairly objective anyway, and um, responsible, ethical in the way that they put articles together and put information out into the world, here in the headline we see directly something that's quite inflammatory. Spawn of Satan. Canada Goose Spawn of Satan terrorizes University of Waterloo. So the use of the verb here, terrorize, immediately paints the goose in quite a bad light and also implies in the use of terror that there are people who are essentially, we get the, the mental image that people are running for their lives. They are screaming, they are running for their lives, and there is imminent physical danger. When in actuality, only a handful of people on campus has, have ever been physically assaulted, and certainly no one has ever died from having a run-in with a Canada goose. Um, 
It's also interesting to note here too that although this is a oops sorry although this is a YouTube video posted by a student on campus that CBC chooses to include within that the title man versus goose which that versus puts these two entities in direct opposition so human versus goose only one can win only one can sort of succeed and triumph over the other so it's very oppositional and creates a kind of rhetoric that is confrontational. By contrast, what's interesting, we'll just look at one example here. So this is in the United States, the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. The headline that they use in this sort of um, help article on their website for people who are experiencing many geese on their property is being proactive, preventing Canada geese from becoming a nuisance. So there are two things that are important here. Number one, being proactive signals to the reader that it's actually their responsibility. So rather than the geese being responsible for what's happening, it places the onus on the human. And then there's also this idea that we can prevent geese from becoming a nuisance and detaching nuisance from a descriptor of the geese. So rather than saying that they are a nuisance, it's the idea that a nuisance is kind of this individual phenomenon that a number of different factors lead to, and that we as humans and readers of this article have a responsibility and a power to either you know, prevent that or to allow it to happen. This is extended through this very first paragraph in the form of logos when it says, this ability to thrive in a variety of habitats can sometimes bring an increase in nuisance complaints. So this divorces the descriptor of nuisance even further away from the goose, and instead it creates it as a kind of human creation. Um, a nuisance complaint is a device of human communication in a system where we have our own concerns. The geese obviously don't know that they're, that they're causing problems, and the nuisance is something that perhaps comes more from our own preferred ways of living and landscaping rather than issuing from the animals themselves. Lastly, I want to focus on a journal article here and bring this back to um, the domain of science communication. Because when we think about journal articles, obviously many science writers are trying to be as objective and sort of distanced from the subject matter as possible. And certainly that comes through in a lot of the overly conventional and even abstract register of the writing in which science is communicated. However, we need to be even more attentive, especially to word choice and adjectives and the descriptors that we place on the subjects of our research. And when we do attach an adjective or a descriptor, we need to be prepared to answer as to why we have done that. So this is the very first page of a journal article from 2006 in the Wildlife Society Bulletin, focused on whether it's effective or not to hunt translocated Canada geese. You'll see in the title here, though, that the authors have made a decision to attach the word nuisance again directly to Canada geese, as probably, you know, in this position, it sends the message that it is the most important descriptor of the geese. So right away, we again are in this position to interpret the geese as inherently problematic, rather than seeing that nuisance is an idea that is constructed by human society coming into contact with things that we don't like. <clears throat> Then, if we trace how the geese are referred to even in this very first page, so down here at the bottom, they're referred to as temperate nesting geese, and we have that repeated as well in the column to the right. And then without any explanation for the transition, in the very next paragraph, we have the term nuisance geese that pops up. What this can do potentially is really implicitly, meaning not in a big, sort of bold and explicit way, but kind of subtle, it just trains the reader into a, over and over again making that association between these words, between nuisance and geese, without the author actually 
defining what they mean by the descriptor of nuisance geese, or making a justification for using that language, whether it comes from someone else in the field or it comes from some sort of other prevalent industry that relates to the research. On top of this, I want to draw out this contradiction that in the left-hand column, these flocks increased dramatically and in succeeding decades caused nuisance problems, which again, like the um, text on the, uh, on the Georgia uh, Natural Resources um, page that we just looked at, tried to distance nuisance from the geese and detach it into its own sort of social construct as an issue. Um, so nuisance problems functions in the text independently from any one entity, whether human or goose. But in shorthand, we then go from nuisance problems to nuisance geese. So there is a really quick and unexplained transition that probably happened unconsciously for the authors, but it can have a big impact on the perception of the subject matter for the reader, again, through repetition and with and because of the lack of making an explicit distinction um, as to what is the difference between a nuisance problem and a nuisance goose. So, to wrap up, rhetoric is intrinsic to communication. We need to accept this if we want to understand how to better utilize rhetoric in any form of communication that we enter into. Science communication, in particular, does rely on rhetoric to convey a convincing argument and a finding. So if you want people to buy into your research and take it seriously, inevitably you will need to have rhetoric in order to persuade them to take it seriously. Word choice and arrangement can directly impact perception of new ideas. And again, this is because we're usually trying to change somebody's perspective with our findings and the presentation of that new information. So we need to be conscious of how we can have unintended consequences if we use poor word choice and poor arrangement of our argument. And lastly, scientists do have an obligation to consider rhetoric whenever they communicate their research because they are subjects too. And all of our communication is infused not only with objective observation, but also subjective experience and emotion. So consider rhetoric as part of your science communication toolkit. It has great potential. It also has some pitfalls that we need to be mindful of whenever we're sitting down to write, whenever we're giving a public presentation, or making some other kind of multimedia communication about our research at hand. Okay, thanks everybody for your time and your, and your attention, and I look forward to having um, more of a discussion about this uh, in the coming weeks.